Hello, I'm the backup to the backup speaker. Yasir couldn't get a visa and Paul had to leave for a medical concern, um, but I'm delighted to talk about our work in sparsity cognizant loop closing. I know I'm going to mess up the uh, slide timings because I didn't make the movie, but um, the uh, in appearance based loop closing was like one of the really big things to come on the scene in the last five to ten years, notably the FabMap. Uh, approach out of Oxford and DBAL and Seek Swam from, from Milford and Wyeth. And this enables uh, using an offline learned dictionary, dictionary to do appearance based loop closing. But two issues that um, uh, might come up are perceptual aliasing. So if, if uh, the, the environment sort of conspires to have scenes that look identical, uh, that and, and if false loop closures to close declared, that might really mess up the state estimation. And also, it'd be great to learn the dictionary online. So in this work, um, the key insight for, for our approach is that the um, uh, loop closing is inherently a sparse problem. So lo loose loop clo closures happen infrequently uh, in many environments. And uh, it, what we hypothesize is that you can formulate the dictionary learning problem online uh, and build it up through the course of an experiment uh, and then try to exploit the sparsity aspect to uh, come up with an efficient formulation to matching to the dictionary as it gets learned uh, online. Okay, so, um, and you can see here that the, from that matrix that the, those are, that was the new college data set and those were sparse loop closures. Okay, so you could formulate the current observation uh, as uh, a, a uh, so that A is the dictionary uh, and, and, and B is the, co the the current observation, and X, the contributions from previous images, you could formulate that as a, as a sort of conventional uh, least squares problem, but then X would be dense. Uh, and if X is dense, that, that's in general bad from the perspective of computational efficiency. So instead, we seek a sparse uh, solution. And you could do this by formulating the zero norm, uh, intuitively just the number of non-zero elements, uh, but then this is an NP-hard problem to solve. And so motivated in, by dramatic advances in vision and signal processing and compress compressive sensing. Uh, I think this is one of the contributions of this work is to bring uh, those techniques, uh, notably L1 mi convex minimization, into this space so that we can relax the problem and we can try to uh, do uh, an L1 norm. X is still sparse and we can create efficient solutions to try to explain the current image as a combination of a small number of previous observations. Now, um, we... So when we, we relax the problem, and, and we set it up in the next slide, come on, with this parameter lambda, which is one of the tricky things, don't ask me about lambda, but a sparsity controlling parameter that will um, help us to get the right blend uh, between explaining in a small number of uh, previous images, but also getting uh, good accuracy. And so uh, here we can basically then cast it into an efficient L1 minimization problem. Now one of the nice things about this, uh, that we like about this approach, is it's very general purpose in terms of what can be the actual matching metric. We kind of think of it as a back-end uh, loop, loop closer. And so shown here on the left are two whole image representations with different levels of resolution, and on the right using, the right using a gist descriptor, again, the new college data set. And so uh, it's a generic sort of way to take different types of descriptors to do the loop closing. So in our paper, we show results from the new college data set and also from the Bokaka data set, and I'll show those uh, in a minute. Now, the approach is meant to be very conservative, so we, want, we don't want to declare a loop closure that, that's wrong, say, due to aliasing. And so, uh, the, so we'll only declare a loop closure if it's globally unique. Now, because when we make a transit through, the, say, the first pass, we will actually get multiple instances of images that are close. And so it does allow us to, take, to achieve multiple loop closures, even though we're aiming for unique matches. And this really made the reviewer's head spin and sometimes makes my head spin, but trust us, it, it, it works. Uh, and so here are precision recall curves, and we're comparing against DBAL, which is using an offline dictionary, so our results look worse, especially for Bukaka, we don't see, achieve higher levels of recall, but the key thing is getting high precision and doing it with an online learned dictionary. And so here's just a short video showing some uh, examples of loop closures achieved on the new college data set and the video will pause uh, on, on loop closures, and we do identify multiple loops. So I think that a contribution here is bringing this L1 compressive sensing view into the uh, appearance-based loop closure 
uh, domain, which has clearly been a, a, a part uh, of our work. And, and my long-term dream is persistent, long-term autonomy, lifelong learning combined with robustness, uh, and so ultimately to go to very large dictionaries. And uh, I'm done. I'm Colin McManus. I'm uh, from the Mobile Robotics Group at Oxford. Sorry, I'm starting early. Cause That's all right. Your video doesn't want to play. Okay, good. Uh, so the title of the talk is uh, Scene Signatures. This was joint work with uh, Ben Upcroft from QUT. And what we're doing here is we're looking at outdoor localization across extreme lighting and weather conditions. And we're taking a bit of a different approach. We're not using point features here because point features tend to not work well when you have such large appearance changes. And we just think it's a bit naive to apply one detector to all images from all places. Especially if you've been there before and you've observed the area under different conditions. So you should be able to learn something from that. So what we're advocating is learning place-dependent feature detectors. And these will find uh, unique visual structure like trees, uh, tree silhouettes, buildings, windows, things like that. Things that you could associate across different conditions. And you could use these for localization. And uh, we learn these offline, it's all unsupervised. And you can get really cool things like even just unique strips that's just unique to that place in particular. And um, we call these scene signatures. They allow us to make associations across some pretty difficult conditions that we just couldn't do using point features alone. And we can use these for localization because, uh, so imagine you're, you're doing your position tracking in the route, you're close to some place, you load up the bank of detectors associated with that place, and uh, then you can run them on the, the live image as demonstrated here. And each scene signature, we learn uh, a landmark position for it. So we can actually do rough metric pose estimation from this. So you're seeing it here. This is the bank of detectors we use. Run it on the live image, make your associations, and that's just your standard pose solve. Now we say it's, it's a weak metric pose estimate, and these are weak localizers because we're not getting too many matches, and a lot of the ones that we do, they're, they're pretty far away, so the translational component isn't really well constrained. So we're giving up a bit in accuracy here. We're talking meters, not centimeters. Uh, and we try to smooth it using the odometry, and we have a, a sliding window pose graph relaxation on this. But, but we're looking at a, a less accurate system than, say, what you might achieve with point features. But the benefit is we can localize in pretty difficult conditions. So on the left, you're seeing the, the visual memory. This is what we're localizing against. On the right, you're going to see transitions to different live views. So snow, pitch black, sun. And uh, the way the system works is the detection block, it runs in a separate thread. It's a bit slower. It's maybe around 5 hertz. And then the main thread's just integrating odometry in between the updates. And, uh, you know, we're pretty pleased with this because our, our standard system just couldn't cope with these types of conditions. And one of the things you'll notice is um, we don't localize every frame. It, it flickers on and off. So there are these, these gaps in between localizations. And this brought up an interesting discussion point, which was what we, we really care about when evaluating the performance of the system. I mean, obviously, we want it to be as close to ground truth as possible. But the other consideration is how far it travels in between these failures, not just number of frames matched or percentage of root uh, matched. Because you could have a system like this that fails frequently, every fifth image, every third image. But we can cope with that. The distance between those failures is, is pretty small. But what we found with the, the point feature-based system that we were using is even if it worked on a large percentage of the route, when it failed, things went really bad. And it would just use dead reckoning for, say, hundreds of meters, which, which isn't acceptable for our application. So uh, what you'll see in a moment here is, is, a, is a plot that shows that when things go wrong, when these systems fail, how likely is it that you're going to travel blind, say, up to 50 meters, 200 meters? And what you'll see is that with this system, even though you're giving up a bit in, in the accuracy, you're gaining a lot in robustness. So that's coming up. And this was a difficult example. So, I mean, we used really challenging data sets. So, I mean, it's, but it, it's, it proves the point. It's showing the point that even if it's not likely your system does fail, when it does, 
which we found with the point feature system, it failed very uh, big in, in, the, in this case, in these situations. Whereas with this system, it was the error was bounded. So um, scene signatures, we're learning these place-dependent feature detectors for localization. Uh, and if you're interested, please come visit me tomorrow at uh, my poster. That's it. Um, the title of this talk is Active Reward Learning. My name is Christian Daniel, and this is joint work together with Malta Fearing, Jan Metz, Oliver Krummer, and Jan Peters. And together we're interested in reinforcement learning for real robots, for example, like the one you see here. Um, and in reinforcement learning, we usually rely on reward functions as uh, sort of condensed task descriptions that guide the learning effort of the robot. Unfortunately, designing these reward functions by hand uh, is hard. So in our experience, um, designing these reward functions is for us often as much a process of trial and error as the learning process of the robot itself. Uh, alternatively, we um, could imp uh, implicitly provide reward functions through demonstrations. Um, however, for tasks that we are considering, this is often difficult because it means we first have to learn very uh, exactly how to control the robot such that we can actually provide um, these desired behaviors. So actually, the ideas that we have um, are somewhat similar to this very interesting talk that we just uh, heard from Maya, um, but we're covering a slightly different set of cases. So basically, uh, we are assuming that the policy that we need to uh, fulfill the task is uh, more complicated, so that we can't rely on the human to correct the policy. And also, we assume that we don't know the outcomes of actions, so that we don't have a model of the environment. Um, so what we're proposing is that the um, robot, what you saw there, um, demonstrates um, skills and the human gives ratings um, so that the robot can then learn a reward model. So we have the robot here in the middle and now in addition to learning a policy that you would all usually do, you also learn the um, reward model. So you can use whatever learner you desire, test your actions on the environment and observe outcomes. And these outcomes then serve as query candidates that you can choose or the robot can choose um, to post to the human such that the human can give ratings. And based on these ratings, the robot now builds a reward model. Now, obviously, in the beginning of learning, um, the actions that the robot will choose will be very bad, so that the um, labels we get from the human will be usually negative, somewhere between don't ever do this again, and you can maybe try something similar next time. So what we really need to do is we need to iteratively learn the policy and the reward model, such that as the reward model guides the policy to better behaviors, we also get um, ratings that indicate, okay, this is really what we want. And we also get a higher resolution in these areas. So one of our main goals here is, of course, to minimize the amount of human interactions, which means that um, we end up with an active learning problem. Um, so our goal is to ask the humans about just enough ratings that we're able to uh, generalize sufficiently well to um, all other outcomes that we observed and that we use for updating our policy. Um, so if we want to do this, we need some kind of notion of uncertainty of our model, um, which means that we uh, need to use a probabilistic model. In our case, we use uh, Gaussian processes. And um, one of the reasons is that uh, using Gaussian processes, um, we can leverage a large amount of Bayesian optimization techniques to efficiently optimize these models. Um, for example, uh, one big problem that we have is human variability. So you ask the human about the same outcome multiple times, he will give you different answers. Um, using GPs, we can explicitly model this variability as a hyperparameter, and we can optimize for this hyperparameter um, directly from data. So we implemented all of this uh, on a real robot, um, and surprise, it worked. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, and the, basically, the first thing we did, we have this uh, paper box in the first picture on the right. It's weighed down with two metal bars. Um, we started our learning. We started with a zero-mean GP as a real model. Um, and with 15 human queries, uh, the robot learned to pick up this robot, uh, this uh, object. Um, but after that, we were interested in uh, figuring out, so we have this uh, reward function now that works for this object. Would it also work for a similar object that the robot has never seen before? So we restarted the learning process for the policy, but we kept the previously learned um, reward model. And it did not allow the robot any more queries to human. Um, and yeah, fortunately, the robot was able to learn um, also to pick up the second object. So I hope I could spike your interest a little bit, and we'll be happy to see you at the post session tomorrow. For the first two speakers, actually, um, if I put a, a GPS on the car, do these problems more or less go away, or how, how important is that then? Uh, GPS, I mean, we would use it when available, but uh, 
even on those outdoor data sets, there's a region we refer to as the region of doom, and it's just some trees, and that causes everything to just go haywire, so we can't depend solely on that. So, uh, Google have shown some compelling videos where they're driving the car in the lane and the GPS estimate is in completely the opposite lane. I think in our approach, I didn't mention it's in the paper, that we do some geometrical and uh, consistency checks on images. So I think GPS might give you a sort of bounded region to reject, uh, but you still ultimately you uh, can't just trust it complete, completely. Do we have some more questions? Up the back there. <coughs> So after you've got an approximate localization with the scene signatures, can you then do a point feature match on the reduced set and get a better localization? Yes, that's, that's something that we've looked at, trying to combine the two. Um, but there are just some cases where it wasn't possible. There's just too, too much motion blur, and you couldn't find any low-level structure. But absolutely, figuring out a way to, to combine the two. I mean, this is just one tool in a suite that we're going to have uh, for this problem. So that's a, that's a good idea. For, for H3, uh, at your experiment, the, you always observe the scene from the same viewpoint and from the same distance. Oh, yeah. So for these experiments, it was blind grasping. Um, so we didn't have any vision at all. Um, the features we used was um, basically just the finger forces and the reward model that the uh, um, human had was that the object should be picked up in a certain orientation and we compared this to basically a hand-coded reward function and what we figured out is like it's very hard to like as a hand-coded reward function you can manage to encode pick up the object but keep the orientation with just the finger forces very hard so we had no vision at all. We've got time for one more question. I was going to ask John about Lambda. Up the back there. Hey, um, for the last speaker, um, what exactly happened the, between uh, human carries? Uh, did the, was the robot allowed to make uh, several actions until he decided to make a human carry? Or? Yeah, so the way it works is um, the robot runs, in this case, was uh, 15 rollouts, also 15 sample actions. Um, for one policy update, and after these 15, before he would actually update the policy, um, he would select from his history of all actions and outcomes uh, which one uh, he would like to credit human for. Is that answered? Let's thank the uh, speakers again. Hi, everybody. My name is Ni Hao. I'm from University of Amsterdam. Today, I'm going to present my work on human activity recognition using soft labels. So in this work, we propose a learning framework which can handle missing labels and also uncertain labels. So um, in this work, um, the task of activity recognition is defined as follows. So we first have a sequence of RGBD videos. We extract some features. And we have a model to predict a sequence of activity labels. So training such a model usually require a large and correctly labeled data set. Uh, however, this is very hard in some cases. Let's take a look at this example here. So the first two segments is a moving activity, last two are placing activity. However, for the activity label in between, the transition segment, it's very hard to tell which activity it belongs to. So if we look into the uh, existing data set, most of them only have one, one activity label associated with, with uh, transition segments. So we think this is not the right way to do so. Therefore, we propose a soft labeling which incorporates the uncertainty of labels. So this is also very useful when we have multiple annotators. So we, when their annotations disagree, disagree with each other, we can use the soft labeling to handle this. So this is a graphic model. This is a factor graph uh, of our model. So we have a, a layer of observations, and we extract some features. And uh, for this, we predict a sequence of activity labels. So that's the inference part. So for learning the model parameters, we, we have a sequence of observations. We also have a sequence of activity labels, which are manually annotated. Uh, so in our case, we can 
we can incorporate the distribution over different activity labels for those transition segments. So in this case, we can handle uncertainty of the labeling as well. And the model is pretty flexible, so we can even leave out some of the labels. So in applications, maybe sometimes we don't have label at all, and we can still use that data to learn our uh, activities. So let's take a closer look at the equations here. So this is the equation we want to minimize, the objective function. And W is the parameters, and also we have a standard regularization term. And the delta function is a loss function, which um, measures the difference between the prediction and our ground truth labels. So usually people use zero one loss here. Here we just did a very simple trick. So we use a notation pi, which is a multinomial distribution over all possible labels. So in, the, in this case, we use, we use this, uh, we call it soft labeling to incorporate the labeling uncertainties. So our learning approach can be decomposed into two steps. The first step is called augmented inference. So first we consider those uncertain labels as latent variables. Because uh, they are, we are not sure about that, then we plug in some additional factors which uh, incorporate the uncertainty, uh, uncertainty of those labels. Um, then we do the inference. We infer the states of all these latent variables. So once the latent variables are known, then the problem becomes a convex optimization problem. The equation is convex, so we can optimize that efficiently using structured SVM. So this is, uh, this is the learning part of our approach. And uh, this graph shows the performance of, of our algorithm compared with the other approaches. Uh, so we evaluate it on the CAD 120 data set, which is uh, created by the Cornell University. And we, we find that if we have more noise in the label, uh, we, we outperform uh, our soft labeling method, outperform the hard labeling method, also outperform the state of the art approach, which use majority voting. And in conclusion, so we have shown that soft labels is very flexible method which can deal with missing labels, also uncertain labels, also when we have multiple annotators, but when they disagree with each other. And uh, our approach provides a unified framework which can use, all, use this kind of uh, missing data, uncertain data to learn the activity models. And also our software is publicly available on our website, so you, can, you are welcome to download and uh, Try it out. And so we would like to thank the European Project a Company to fund us. And, uh, and tomorrow we will have a poster session. If you are interested, you're welcome. And that's all. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Cohen. And I'm here to present on planning single arm manipulations with N-arm robots. Uh, this is joint work with my lab mate, Mike Phillips, and our advisor, uh, Max Likachev. Uh, I'm from UPenn, and they're from CMU. So in most of our research labs, we have a single arm because they're really expensive. But actually, in the wild, uh, naturally, arms are found in herds, OK? On, a, on the floor of a factory, uh, you'll find hundreds of arms. And even in home robotics, too, right? We keep designing our Rosies from the Jetsons with two arms, not one. And in most of these cases, you have arms that actually share workspaces with each other. So if you just gave these arms the ability to hand up an object between each other, now the workspace of a single arm becomes that of the entire set of arms. And also, your arm can now regrasp an object uh, with a handoff instead of a slow put down and pick up. So the goal here is to come up with a motion planner capable of, capable of planning the motion for the arm or arms required to move an object from point A to point B. And for that, the planner has to reason about a whole bunch of stuff that we'll talk about. Okay, but in motion planning, we want our planner to be fast, right? So uh, for this, uh, one of our goals is we want the planner to be fast. We also want to generate high quality solutions. And we also want the planner to be consistent, OK? And by that, I mean, given similar input, you get similar output. And why is that important? Because we keep talking about human-robot collaboration. And now I'm a factory worker, right? And I'm working near a robotic arm. No more cage, OK? So I, w I know the task it's doing. I want to be able to safely predict how it's going to do it, OK? So uh, here we have an example uh, of this futuristic bar. We want to move this tray from the left side of the bar to the right. Uh, in pink, we see the initial pose. In green, we see the goal pose. And we, uh, it must be happy hour. We have a lot of bartenders. We have three arms working this bar, OK? So the planner will decide, is one arm needed, or is all three needed, or is two needed? The planner will make that decision. Also, 
we have a set of pre-computed grasps for this object that the planner could use. So the goal is to find a path from that pink post to the green post. And this problem is really interesting, right? Because we actually have discrete components and continuous components. We have to figure out the arm and grasp for the object pickup and the put down, uh, and about the handoffs. Do we need a handoff? And for each handoff, who, what, where, when, and why? And now, the continuous side, we have to figure out that sixth off motion that the object is going to take from the start to the goal, and the joint space trajectory from the start uh, for each support arm along the way. And now this is the solution that we planned. And this video is really boring. It's boring because uh, it does exactly what you'd expect it to do. Uh, the near arm to the start picks it up, gives it to the middle arm. Middle arm gives it to the third arm. It's closest to the, the goal. Third arm puts it at the goal. It took like six and a half seconds to plan this path. This one is a little bit more interesting. Same start pose. But the goal pose is now underneath the bar. And you saw our pre-computed set of grasps. Only one of them is valid here. So the planner, when it's uh, figuring out the details of the second handoff, it's going to have to reason about uh, the second arm has to give it to the third arm such that the third arm can grasp it with that grasp so that the goal is feasible. And this took about eight seconds to plan. So for our approach, we used a search-based planner, uh, weighted A star, because combinatorial searches are really good at handling problems with discrete and continuous uh, components to them. We also used it because uh, two of our goals are consistency and high-quality solutions, and search-based planners will give you that. But our third goal is we want the planner to be fast, OK? And we know that in high-dimensional spaces, uh, search-based planners tend to slow down, right? So we had to come up with these components to deal with that. And the first one is we use a lazy version of weighted A-star. Uh, with it, we get the same uh, performance boost that you get with weighted A-star and all of its theoretical guarantees. But now we could postpone the expensive evaluation of edges uh, until the search realizes that those edges are needed to find the solution. And now we're doing handoffs here. So you can imagine that we're going to have to call a single arm path planner many times during the search, it could get expensive. So now we have a really efficient search, but we have a huge configuration space. So for that, we had to come up with a compact graph representation, and we did, uh, and it's nice. Uh, it scales well with the number of arms, okay? And all these arms could be different, and they could all have different kinematics, and you could have a KUKA, hand something off to a Motoman, we could make peace, they could all be different, okay? Uh, also, our graph representation is nice because it supports regrasping. But now we have a compact graph and a fast search. But your A star variants are only good if you have a good heuristic. And like I said before, we have these two sub problems. So we have to come up with two heuristics that we combine to deal with both of them. And the first one helps the object guide, uh, guides the object around obstacles from the start to the goal. And the second one, it helps the planner reason about which arm and grasp to use at which, at which time, and also uh, minimize the number of handoffs. So we have experimental results for two, three, and four arms. Uh, we have a comparison to another planner. Uh, we also have a whole lot of video in different scenarios, including a factory scenario. So if you're interested in the details, stop by the poster tomorrow morning. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Soha, and I'm going uh, to present the work, the, our predictive uh, approach to our 3D walking uh, control of humanoid uh, robot Coman. Coman is a co compliant version of ICOP. Um, it's um, one meter tall, weights. 30 kilograms. It's torque controlled and it uses uh, electric motors. And it's by, uh, built by IIT. For the control um, of working for this robot, we proposed um, uh, control ar architecture with three, three layers. On top, we have a foot step planner that gets uh, the desired velocity and uh, returns the next uh, foot step location. Then we have the Cartesian trajectory planner. And at the end, we have whole body controller that finds the optimal joint torques to realize the motion. Uh, our foot step planner is basically a model predictive control. It uses um, inverted pendulum as the sim uh, simplified system dynamics for the humanoid. It plans over foot steps uh, rather than time steps. Since it's using a very simplified model, it can perform uh, online and it can per uh, provide online predictions for us. And um, uh, by its definition, it can uh, include different physical performance uh, constraints. Um, for the whole body controller, uh, we use um, QP formulation uh, that could optimize for joint torques, for um, joint acceleration and contact forces. Uh, and it is subject to different physical and um, uh, performance 
um, constraints, for instance, uh, equation of motion, center of pressure, joint torque limits, uh, friction cones, etc. Uh, by using uh, highly efficient um, uh, solvers and also by uh, handling the matrix um, sparsity, we could um, make it to work uh, in real time. For instance, on a normal core i5 laptop, we can get uh, the result in 1.5 1.7 milliseconds. Um, as the results, let's first look at the whole body controller performance. For instance, you can see in different scenarios uh, that the robot is doing rhythmic tasks in uh, Cartesian space. Um, you need just to specify the acceleration for the end effectors. Then we add the foot step planner uh, the first column in the left, you can see the normal walking and also turning for the robot. Um, we also test the method for the per perturbed walking by using um, different sources of um, perturbation. From the left again, uh, we control loop delay with large model modeling errors that the robot is not aware of those. Uh, with sensor noise, uh, moderate values, and also in the right movie, you can see by adding external perturbations in different directions in different places. And as you can see, the robot is able to keep the balance, replan the motion, and continue working. Um, we also tested the method on rough terrain. Um, on the left, with height variation, and in the uh, right, you can see on a a slope with uh, varying uh, uh, values. Um, what is remarkable is that the robot uh, is blind. It's not using any perception. Adding perception there uh, can uh, improve the performance further. To conclude, we use simplified models, abstract models at the level of planning, and we use um, detailed and high dimensional models at the level of execution. We use model predictive control to handle un uncertainties through uh, its replanning. And um, we don't use any offline optimization. All the planning and whole body optimization is uh, uh, actually happening online. Uh, for the ongoing work, um, we are extending uh, the internal model. We are transferring and testing the methods on the uh, command robot. As you can see, Salman here, he's uh, the guy behind most of this job that he couldn't make it to the conference. I'm presenting on his behalf. And um, yeah, we are very excited about this work. Uh, for more details and more videos, you can come and uh, see our poster tomorrow. Question for the first speaker. Um, is there, is the method you're proposing have many benefits on over um, labeling those transition periods as transitions? Have you tried doing that? Uh, excuse me? So the overlapping periods, you're labeling them with, with soft labels. Um, yeah. What if you labeled them as transitions and um, used it as a kind of a special case, you know, label? Oh, um, it's an interesting idea. We haven't tried that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions out there? One at the back there, right middle. Uh, for the second talk, uh, if at some point the object can be uh, grasped by uh, two arms do you, or multiple arms, do you reason about all these grasps and does this affect the completeness uh, of the method? Uh, actually, it could handle if uh, the object is within the workspace of both arms. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah. I've got, a qu I've got a question for uh, Soha. Mm -hmm. um, the walking biped looked, it was familiar to me in terms of Big Dog. And mm -hmm. I kind of see the videos where they kick Big Dog on, on slippery terrain. Mm -hmm. Do you think your model would be able to deal with that kind of like slip, slip and those kind of things? Uh, we haven't tested it, but uh, one thing which is uh, specific about this approach is that we are not lying, relying on uh, ankle torque. And all this concept of being able to take steps to compensate for the perturbation helps us to um, be able to handle this kind of um, 
uh, scenarios. Uh, so uh, we should test it and see to what extent it can handle that. But um, uh, yeah, in, comparison, in terms of uh, being able to handle the perturbations by taking the steps, um, it seems promising. Any more questions out there? I've got one more. Thanks. Um, you've shown a, a demonstration where you have uh, multiple arms manipulating a single object. Oftentimes we have the dual problem where a single arm has to manipulate multiple objects, like reach into a fridge, move things around, grab the things that you care about. Can you talk about how you can use the similar ideas that you have for the dual problem? Uh, we haven't really thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried about one. Um, yeah. Uh, are you saying take the, the objects into account? Or but instead of the, uh, the arm handing things off to other arms, you can think of multiple objects being used by a single robot as the arm handing things off to itself, like taking it and placing it somewhere else, for example. So you can envision using some heuristics of movement for multiple states and operations like that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> we, we'll look into it. Thank you. We might thank all the speakers again. Thank you very much. <laughs>